a couple weeks ago the book of Philippians. Um, and before I jump into a <clears throat> new book, I'm just going to do a few psalms uh, in the interim. Uh, so today I'd like to look at Psalm chapter 39. If you could turn that, that mic down, Ralph. It's squeaking back a little bit. I don't need it so loud. So Psalm 39 today. Um, a few years ago, I was passing by an old cemetery, uh, really in the middle of nowhere, it seemed, uh, upstate New York, uh, on the way to almost to Oneonta. And I pulled over and st- I drove by this little cemetery, really old, so I stopped in there and looked at the old gravestones. I don't know if you've ever done that. Um, that might seem weird to you, but um, I think it's cool. Um, and a lot of these stones were from the 1800s, some even from the 1700s. Some of them were veterans from the Revolution, some veterans from War of 1812, I think, Civil War. Um, and, you know, if you can judge the character of a generation by what is engraved on their, or written on their gravestones, I can conclude then that the people who lived during those times, 18th, 19th century, I think they had a greater fear of God uh, than we do today. Many of the gravestones had meaningful, good sayings based upon biblical truth, and they had good Bible verses. Uh, Some of these sayings really shed light on the fact that these people in our country who lived during those times were much more heavenly minded, I think, than we are today. Um, one of the ones I took a picture of that I really thought was good was on the gravestone of a 46-year-old man. And by our standards, very young, and even then, pretty young. And on it, he said, adieu, like, farewell, my friends. Dry up your tears. I must lie here till Christ appears. I like that. And, you know, in those days before there was life-saving medical interventions and and medicines and things. Death was seemingly everywhere and could come for anyone at any time. Several of the gravestones I saw were from young children, eight years old, four years old, even younger. One one gravestone from a small child, I think they're about four or so, said, from death's arrest, no age is free. From death's arrest, no age is free. It's true. Um, death can come in infancy, it can come at 100 plus. People, uh, especially children, in those times could die and did die from things that today we treat pretty easily, such as an infection that in our day we would use antibiotics to cure. Um, it could seem like nothing to us now, but a couple hundred years ago you could die. Um, I remember my grandmother told me that she had a sister who was very young um, who died from an abscess tooth. You don't hear of that happening anymore. Um, I heard Jack Daniels, the man who invented whiskey, got mad, the the whiskey brand, uh, got mad one day and kicked his safe and broke his toe and then died of an infection. (laughs) I mean, you don't hear of these things happening today. Um, and this was the case really throughout all of human history uh, up until recently. Uh, people who lived 100 or more years ago were much more aware of the fact that at any given moment they could be taken from this life. They seemed to be more interested in numbering their days, so to speak, than, than we are today. And as much as I hate death, and I think the older I get, the more I hate death, uh, and I hate funerals, and I hope I never have to go to a funeral, but I'm sure I'm going to have to go to many. Um, no one enjoys funerals, but I do like to preach at funerals um, simply because it's a rare situation where you have many, oftentimes, unsaved people who try their very best to avoid thinking about death every day, and now, in the midst of a funeral service, they have no choice but to think about it. And they see a casket or something or pictures, and they, they, they have to think about how short life is. And it's there that they can hear the gospel, the captive audience, and that's the only thing that can solve this problem of death, which sin has created. 
So for the Christian, I think it's important that we think more and more about how short our life is and that death awaits us all. And the reason I say that is not because I'm morbid and I enjoy thinking about death, but because the Bible talks extensively about how short life is. And today's psalm is no exception. David and other psalmists reflected upon the fleeting nature of life. So did the prophets. So did Jesus himself. And for the Christian, death has no victory. Death has no sting for us. But when we think about the shortness of life, the eternity of heaven, it helps us to prepare accordingly and and helps us to glorify God uh, with the short time that he's blessed us with here on earth. So let's read Psalm chapter 39. To the choir master, Jejuthin, a psalm of David. I said I will guard my ways that I may not sin with my tongue. I will guard my mouth with a muzzle so long as the wicked are in my presence. I was mute and silent. I held my peace to no avail, and my distress grew worse. My heart became hot within me as I mused the fire burned. Then I spoke with my tongue. O Lord, make me know my end. And what is the measure of my days? Let me know how fleeting I am. Behold, you have made my days a few handbreadths, and my lifetime is as nothing before you. Surely all mankind stands as a mere breath. Surely a man goes about as a shadow. Surely for nothing they are in turmoil. Man heaps up wealth and does not know who will gather. And now, O Lord, for what do I wait? My hope is in you. Deliver me from all my transgressions. Do not make me the scorn of the fool. I am mute. I do not open my mouth, for it is you who have done it. Remove your stroke from me. I am spent by the hostility of your hand. When you discipline a man with rebukes for sin, you consume like a moth what is dear to him. Surely all mankind is a mere breath. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and give ear to my cry. Hold not your peace at my tears, for I am a sojourner with you, a guest like all my fathers. Look away from me that I may smile again before I depart and am no more. So a good portion of this psalm, kind of the main body, is about the brevity of life, the shortness of life. But I find it interesting that before David addresses uh, the fleeting nature of life, he talks about a problem he's going through. And he talks about guarding his mouth. And it's only after those things that he says in verses 1 to 3 that he then goes on to talk about how fleeting, how vain uh, life on this planet is. And so it's clear David's going through some kind of difficulty, some kind of trial uh, that later in verses 10 and 11 he describes as chastisement or discipline from God. And it's painful. There's been some kind of loss, it seems, in his life. Verse 11 kind of alludes to that. Something happened in life that's not, uh, that wasn't ideal, right? Something's wrong. <clears throat> he doesn't tell us exactly, he doesn't tell us specifically what it is, and, and, and that's a good thing, because when talking about um, trials and tribulations, uh, oftentimes the scriptures, even you'll see this in the New Testament, uh, they're not specific usually, or oftentimes they're not specific as to what the trial is. And, and I believe one of the reasons why God designed his word that way is because if a trial is mentioned by name in the, in the passage, um, and then you might read it and say, well, I can't relate to that. That's not what I'm going through, so this obviously is something different. It's not something that I can apply um, so, for example, <clears throat> if David said, you know, his main issue here is being mocked by unbelievers, you might say, well, that, that doesn't bother me, uh, or I don't have to deal with that. Um, and then, then you would miss any application that might, might be there for you in whatever different situation you're in. <clears throat> but thankfully, the Holy Spirit inspired David to keep this tribulation that he's going through kind of vague. And for that reason, we can find a greater um, span of application for whatever situation we're going through in our lives at the moment. 
And while we may not know the details of his problem, what we do know is that he said he's going to keep his mouth shut while he's around the wicked, while he's around uh, unbelievers. The wicked is just another name for unbelievers to us. Uh, and now you might think of wicked as like someone doing something extra bad, but really you're either wicked or you're saved. Um, we would probably use the term unbelievers um, more frequently, but that's who he's referring to, un- unbelievers, the wicked. He said, I said, I will guard my ways that I may not sin with my tongue. I will guard my mouth with a muzzle so long as the wicked are in my presence. So David resolved not to sin with his mouth in front of the wicked. And so there's some lessons for us about sinning with our tongue, sinning with our words. The Bible in many places talks about the power of our words, right? for, for better or for worse, for, for good or for evil. Uh, the tongue is a powerful thing. Look at what James says in James chapter 3. He says, And the tongue is a fire a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. For the same, from the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Right, so as Christians, you know we have to be on guard and must resolve along with David not to sin with our tongues. So what you say to someone, whether it be verbally or whether it be in our day with, via texting or email or social media, what you say to somebody can absolutely destroy a person um, and even worse, destroys your, your testimony as a Christian and brings reproach upon the name of Christ. But hurting the heart of an image bearer of God is not the only harm that, comes, that can come from our mouth. It can be uh, something as simple as complaining, right? That can be a sin of your tongue. Notice that David guarded his mouth while he was around the wicked. I think that's interesting. Maybe... Uh, he didn't want them to hear complaining or something. Uh, when unbelievers hear us complain and, and grumble about our poor circumstances in life, it doesn't make Jesus look so appealing to them. Uh, so remember, we talked about contentment, right? When we're not content and we grumble and complain, we are uh, essentially telling the world around us, unbelievers, uh, that Jesus is not enough, that we need something else than, other than salvation. So the last thing you want to do is give an impression to the wicked, to unbelievers, that Jesus is not the all-satisfying Savior that he is. So perhaps David's holding back his speech among the wicked because he doesn't want them uh, to have an excuse or reason to blaspheme God and to say, see, God isn't that great. So we have to understand the power of our words. It's one thing to have a sinful thought come into your mind. That's bad enough, right? It's another thing to have it come out of your mouth. So you may sin with your thoughts, and that's not good, right? But then you compound your sin, you make it worse when something comes out of your mouth. So guard your tongue, guard your fingertips, deal with your sinful thoughts. So James 1 also <clears throat> tells us that everyone should be quick to listen, but slow to speak and slow to anger. That seems to be a rare trait for people um, these days and probably throughout human history, um, but it's also sadly rare among Christians, right? If you, if you want to avoid sinning with your mouth, sometimes you just need to be quiet and listen. Put a muzzle on your mouth. Don't always feel like you have to say something all the time. Be careful. Be slow to speak because your tongue has the power to hurt people. Resolve like David did not to sin with your mouth. Verse 2, he says, I was mute and silent. I held my peace to no avail, and my distress grew worse. So apparently David's thinking, if I could just refrain from sinning with my mouth, with my tongue, everything's going to be okay, right? But what happened is his distress grew worse. He held his peace to no avail. It didn't do him any, any good 
on the inside. Some translations say, I kept silence even from speaking good. I didn't say anything at all. And yet, look what he says in verse 3. My heart became hot within me. As I mused, the fire burned. Then I spoke with my tongue. So it's bottling up in him. You ever have that happen? Something bottles up over time. Right? Something's bothering you. You might keep your mouth shut, but it's kind of like your heart is burning, right? He, he's trying to maintain his cool amongst these wicked people, wherever he is, we don't know. Whatever situation is, we don't know. He wants to say something, but he guards his tongue. And what happens? He's, he's burning up inside. Remember Yosemite Sam from the Looney Tunes? Whenever he used to get angry and steam would come out of his ears? That's kind of like what's happening when he was mad. Bottling up. It says his heart became hot within him. And that's the issue, isn't it? The heart. You can control your actions. You can control your tongue all you want. But the main issue is what's going on in your heart. Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So it's not only the words themselves that's the issue. It's, it's what's going on in your heart. And David has some heart issues here that he needs to deal with. And the more he thinks about this, the more it burns. He says, as I mused, as I thought about this, the fire burned. Whatever's going on is getting him upset, angry. Maybe perhaps he's envious of the wicked like Asaph was in Psalm 73 because he's around them, right? And they seem to be having a grand old time. They're prospering, and he's going through something of a loss, something of God's heavy hand of discipline upon himself, and they don't. To me, that seems to be probably the logical, most logical conclusion, given the latter part of the, of the chapter here, but we don't know for, for sure. Either way, yes, David refrained from sinning with his tongue, which is good, but he's still sinning with his heart. Something's not right in there. So as a result, he begins to speak with his tongue, but he doesn't speak to men. He's not going to lash out at these wicked people or to anyone else, he, but he speaks to God. He speaks to God. Um, so the rest of the chapter, verses 4 to 13, is David speaking to God, David praying. And for some reason, this burning up inside of his heart while he's among the wicked causes him to reflect on the shortness of life. He's thinking about the trial that he's going through, the, the heavy hand of God's discipline on him. He sees the wicked most likely in a prosperous condition, not suffering the same way that he is, and causes him to cry out to God and ask God to make the fleeting nature of life very real to him. And I think a major lesson to learn from this passage is that no matter what difficulty, no matter what trial or form of chastisement that God has laid upon you, use that situation to cause you to look to God, to look heavenward, to cry out to him, that he would teach you to number your days. Pray that God's disciplining hand that is on you would cause you to see that life is truly short and that you need to redeem the time that God's given you to use it for his glory. Typically, when we go undergo trials and tribulations, it's probably not the first place our minds go to, right? The shortness of life. Uh, but I think it should. Typically, when we go through hard times, when we're in the valleys of life, uh, we just might pray for relief, for the thing to go away, which, you know, the thing we want to end. And that's not wrong in and of itself, uh, so, you know, so long as it's not fueled by a discontented heart. Um, we can pray for a change in circumstances, but we have to remember that God uses um, trials to, to discipline us. And there's a there's a purpose for it. And really, the purpose of, of all kinds, of, any kind of discipline uh, is there to correct behavior. Right? That is why parents are to discipline their children, to correct behavior. Um, and the, the purpose uh, of God's discipline is to show us our sin so that we will repent of that sin and become more like Christ. Uh, and so one way in which to not waste the chastisement that God sends your way, and to be sure that you're listening to 
the, the correction and learning from it is to pray that God would give you a very clear sense of how short your life is. Uh, so let's move on to see more of David's prayer. Verses, uh, look at verse 4. So he says, and I spoke with my tongue, verse 3, O Lord, make me know my end and what is the measure of my days. Let me know how fleeting I am. It's probably unique to the believer in Jesus to say something like that. Lord, show me how short my life is. Or to the non-Christian who has no hope of salvation, whose only hope is in this life, the last thing they want to think about is how short life is. And David's saying, Lord, remind me, show me how short life is. He wants a sobering reminder that this life is but a vapor. The person who has no hope of salvation does not want that reminder. They will do whatever they can to distract themselves from the reality that life is short and that one day they will die. Why would David and why should we as Christians want to always keep the brevity of life in our minds? When Psalm Chapter 90, which was actually written by Moses, interestingly enough, says this. For all our days pass away under your wrath. We bring our years to an end like a sigh. The years of our life are 70, or even by reason of strength, 80. Yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone and we fly away. Who considers the power of your anger and your wrath according to the fear of you? So teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. We may get a heart of wisdom. Numbering your days, living your life in light of the reality of the fleeting nature of time will cause us to be wiser with how we live. Who will live more foolishly? The one who knows he's on borrowed time or the one who thinks they have unlimited days? But they just kind of block it out of their mind and assume that they're going to live to 120 or something. And everything's going to go smoothly. Who's, who's the wisest in that situation? Jesus gave the parable of the rich fool in Luke 12, where uh, the, the, the rich man stored uh, his barns with food, and he built new barns, bigger barns, to store his food. And the rich man said to himself, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool. This night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? It was the rich man who stored up all his possessions, acting as if he had unlimited time on earth, and Jesus calls people like that fools. If you don't number your days, you will not be wise. You will be a fool, because at any moment the Lord can take your life away. We need to live our lives not as the wicked do, who act as though they're they're here forever, but instead we need to know how fleeting we are, that we are here for but a moment, and when we number our days, we'll have a heart of wisdom. And it must not be a numbering of days that's superficial, like we were talking about bucket lists before. Some people know, oh, this life is short, so i got to get all my bucket lists done. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about eternity living in in light of eternity, numbering our days in light of eternity. Because an unbeliever could have, yes, this life is short, so i got to get all these things done here before I go. Um, And if that's it, that is is not a wise use of numbering our days, numbering our days in in light of eternity. So David first asked God to show him how short life is. Then the next verse, in verse 5, David kind of answers his own question. Or perhaps God revealed it to him, Right then and there, through the Holy Spirit, as he's praying, he says, verse 5, Behold, you have made my days a few handbreaths, and my lifetime is as nothing before you. Surely all mankind stands as a mere breath. He says his days are a few handbreaths. The handbreath was the the width of your four fingers. That was the smallest unit of measurement in ancient times. Um, So if you were to measure the span of your life in inches, let's say, and compare it to, let's say, the size of Earth, it's just a few inches. It's nothing, right? And and the older you get, the more you begin to realize that. The older you get, the smaller the hand width becomes, it seems. And when you're a kid, 
<clears throat> and you children here can relate to this probably, uh, you kind of feel like you're going to be a kid forever. But then when you grow up, time flies, and you begin to realize that our days really are a hand breath. One day you're in kindergarten, the next day you qualify for the senior discount at Arby's. He says that our lifetime is as nothing before God. We're like a puff of smoke, right, compared to the eternal nature of God, who always was and always will be. What's a hundred years compared to our God, who has always existed, and compared to the eternity of heaven? Surely all mankind stands as a mere breath, he says. That word breath in, in, in Hebrew is actually the same word that Solomon uses in Ecclesiastes for vanity. It's like saying all of our lives are vain, they're nothing. Not that human life is not valuable, it's precious, right, because we're made in the image of God, but in, in the long scheme of things, we're here and we're gone, it's like nothing. Psalm 103, 15 to 16 it says, as for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field. For the wind passes over it and it's gone and its place knows it no more. So we're here, we're gone, and guess what? We're forgotten. Eventually, one generation later, no one knows you anymore. You're done. And all that you left behind. People might know about you, but eventually, once your prodigy dies out, it gets to the point where no one knows you anymore. You were just another one of the billions of souls that have existed since creation. We're here, we're gone, and we're forgotten. And that's okay. Verse 6, Surely a man goes about as a shadow. Surely for nothing they are in turmoil. Man heaps up wealth and does not know who will gather. The unbeliever's life is like a shadow, right? There's no substance to it. It's hollow. It's void of anything substantial. Not only that, the person who doesn't have Christ lives a, a wasted life. Their whole existence is, is a waste. Surely for nothing they're in turmoil. Uh, and, and like the rich fool that Jesus talks about, they gather up wealth and they don't know who's going to collect it. They don't know who's going to gather it because they're going to die and they could die in the middle of their pursuits of earthly riches. The unbeliever stores up for himself treasures on earth for this life because this is all they have. Now after all this uh, waxing eloquently about the vanity and shortness of life. Is there anything positive here? We're just life, life is just so meaningless and then we all die and that's it. Look at verse 7 and 8. And now, O oh Lord, for what do I wait? My hope is in you. Deliver me from all my transgressions. Do not make me the scorn of the fool. If you have a worldview void of the God of the Bible, you still can't get around the fact that life is short. And I think all humans would agree to that, that it's short. And so you, have, you really have two choices, that life is meaningless, life is void of any lasting hope, and that's what nihilism is, or, that's the first option, or there's hope, and it's found in Christ. That's it. It's only two options. David spent some, some time kind of in distress over this idea of the vanity and shortness of life. And he says, Lord, for what do I wait? What, what am I waiting for? Why, why am I dwelling on this? He says, my hope is in you. Hope for this short life is found only in one place, and that's in Jesus Christ. Why, why is he hopeful in God? He says, deliver me from all my transgressions. So his hope is not in his health. It's not in his wealth. He's not, his hope is not in getting a few extra years on earth. His hope is in the forgiveness of his sins. And when you have your sins forgiven through repentance and, and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and what he has done, it doesn't matter how short your life is. It doesn't matter if you live 10 years or 110 years. The only thing that matters is that you have eternal life through Jesus Christ. That is where our hope is is found in the forgiveness of sins through the shed blood of Christ on the cross and his resurrection. Deliverance from sin was David's hope and our hope, and, and that is found only in God. So you have two choices with how you want to deal 
with the fleeting reality of, of life. It's hopelessness, meaninglessness, or there's hope in Christ. And when people really just stop and think about the bigger questions of life, the questions we like to avoid, you will come to the inevitable conclusion that without Christ, life in general is meaningless and it's not worth living. So every human being should stop and examine what they believe and how they are living and say, what is the point of all of this? What is the point of going through all the messed up things in life, just a few years, work to accumulate some things, maybe have a few moments of happiness, and then all the things we worked for one, one day just gone, taken away without any notice. What is the point? This is why Christianity and the Bible is true, because without the Bible, nothing makes sense. Everything is meaningless. Everything is empty. There's no explanation for anything. A life lived without glorifying God through the submission to the Lordship of Christ is a wasted life and a life without hope. Nihilism and every other false worldview is, basically says life has no purpose. They might not tell you that. They'll, they'll, they'll give you a, f a fake reason for purpose. It's not true. So therefore, life has no purpose. And some will act, atheists and agnostics who, agnostics who are, uh, who like Nietzsche and other nihilists will just say, life is meaningless, has no purpose. Christianity says the purpose of life is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. If I can sum what they steal from the Westminster Confession. Glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Right? We have hope. We have the forgiveness of sins through Christ who unites us to God. Right? No, other, no other belief system can give you that. John Calvin said, Without the gospel, everything is useless and vain. Let's look at verses 9 to 11. He says, I am mute. I do not open my mouth, for it is you who have done it. Remove your stroke from me. I am spent by the hostility of your hand. When you discipline a man with rebukes for sin, you consume like a moth what is dear to him. Surely all my mankind is a mere breath. So David's saying, God, you kept my mouth closed. And then he, he asked God to remove this heavy hand of discipline upon him. He says he's spent by the hostility of God's hand. And the disciplining chastening hand of the Lord uh, who has brought this unknown trial upon David is wearing David out. Stick a fork in him, he's done, right? You ever feel like that from trials that you're just worn out, especially things that just never seem to go away? Um, they last perhaps for years. I think we all feel like that sometimes. We're just worn out from it. David felt that way. He said, I'm, I'm spent. Uh, in King James, it says, I'm consumed it's okay to plead for God's mercy during hard times. In fact, I would encourage it. I think we all need, need that. David did it. And always remember that God promised a bruised reed he will not break, a smoking flax he will not consume. He might bruise us, but he's not going to break us. One of the few things that Job's friend Eliphaz said that was true was he said, God's wound, God wounds, but he binds up. He shatters, but his hands heal. Yes, God's hand of discipline in our lives at times just wears us out and at times brings out the worst in us. It can bring sins to the surface that we had no idea were even there. But always remember that God disciplines the ones whom he loves. And David said that when we're, we're disciplined for sin, perhaps sins we didn't even know we had, God consumes like a moth that which is dear to him. Just like a moth would eat clothing, right? That would render the garment fit for the trash heap, which was kind of a big deal back then. Because you'd have to make your own clothes, and it was a labor-intensive process. Um, and they didn't have mothballs and stuff like that. So it... The moth would eat the garment, you had to throw it out. Right? He's saying that God takes away things from us like a moth eats a garment. Things that maybe we've worked 
hard to attain, right? And God just takes it like that. And he does that in order to conform us to the image of his son. Sometimes he takes our health. Sometimes he takes possessions or wealth. Sometimes he even takes loved ones away from us. David had something he held dear taken away from him. And it was painful. And that is what caused him to think about the shortness of life. He says again there, Surely all mankind's a breath. Anything or anyone can be taken from us by God at any moment, and that's why we need to number our days. Now, for the conclusion of this prayer, David pleads for mercy from God. Verse 12 and 13, Hear my prayer, O Lord, and give ear to my cry. Hold not your peace at my tears, for I am a sojourner, a visitor with you, a guest like all my fathers. Look away from me that I may smile again before I depart and am no more. Many, you know, you read the Psalms, a lot of them end on a high note, right? Uh, David uh, might be crying out for deliverance from his enemies, and at the end he gets delivered. Um, Or he's sad, and then he ends up praising God. Um, But this psalm kind of ends on a somber, kind of sad note, right? It ends with, a simple plea for mercy that God would turn his wrath away from David so that he can be happy again. So he's not happy at the moment. He's, he's in sadness and he's asking God to have mercy. Uh, he asks God to listen to him and not to hold peace at his, at his tears. If you cr- contrast that with back in verse 2 where David said, I held my peace to no avail. Right? David's saying, I held my peace. I was quiet. I was silent. But please, God, don't be silent with me, please see my tears. The tears, as another psalm says, that you collect, he collects in his bottle, right? And he, hear me and, and speak to me. Be merciful to me. And then David says something that is um, a sobering and encouraging reality: that we are just sojourners here, right? We are we are visiting. We are guests. Uh, this is. God's world and God's kingdom and in his mercy he's chosen us to be his guests we're here temporarily for a short time that's what a sojourner does in in the old testament yeah you were to welcome the sojourner king james says alien right the the foreigner who comes in to stay with you um they're just there temporarily they might be staying in israel temporarily for a short time that's what our lives are like that um it, so it it we're just visiting for a short time. That really portrays um, the meaningfulness of this life, uh, that we're just visiting guests of the Lord. Um, that gives us hope. That gives us purpose. Hope that's not found in anything the world has to offer. Hope that's not found in any person or thing that, that God can just take from us at any time. So our hope is not... Here, we're just passing through. Our hope is our final home, which is heaven with Christ. And when you find yourself asking questions like, what is the purpose of it all? I think it just shows you that you weren't made for this life that we're visiting. We're sojourners. We're we're passing through. C.S. Lewis said, if we find ourselves with a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy the most probable explanation is that we were made for another world. Where nothing can satisfy us in this world, it probably means we're made for something else, for another world. We're sojourners here. We're visiting. Our home is not here in this short life. Our home is in heaven with the Lord. And so when we go through trials and tribulations, when the Lord takes away things in our life that we hold dear, And it's painful. Remember that this life is but a vapor. But by God's grace and through faith in Christ, we have an eternal home in heaven with the Lord. Our hope is in God who delivers us from all of our transgressions through the shed blood of Jesus. Let's pray. O Lord, teach us to number our days. Lord, show us. Lord, give us a a glimpse Lord, of the reality of this fleeting life. And Lord, may we not 
uh, find ourselves in despair over this, but find hope in Christ. Lord, that our sins are forgiven. Lord, that is our hope. That is what encourages us. That is what gives us uh, the grace to, to persevere through life, Lord, and to not sin with our mouth, to not complain, and Lord, to know that our home is in heaven with you. May that be our reality that we remind ourselves of every day. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.